Did you know that simply by having an online presence, you could become the target of a scam? You can become the victim of a cybercrime. The image that we all have of a scruffy looking lone scammer working from an internet cafe or a dingy flat in Nigeria somewhere is simply a myth. It is also a myth that only stupid people get scammed. Scams are in fact orchestrated by highly sophisticated and well-organized groups of people that are part of a syndicate. They work within a network that, that operates with military precision. They are experts in mind control and alienating victims or clients from their circle of trust. Today, we're going to introduce you to Dr. Jonathan Farley. He is a scam survivor. Dr. Farley won the Oxford University's highest awards of mathematical graduate students. His experience of getting scammed is an excellent example to help us dispel the myth that scams only happen to stupid people. Don't go away, we will be right back. Welcome back. This is episode 11 of the Conversation Online Safety. I'm your host, Bridgetti Limbanda. To illustrate why people who get scammed are not stupid. Not knowing how to fly a plane or not having a formal degree doesn't make you a stupid person. Not knowing how to drive a 16-wheeler doesn't make you stupid. It simply makes you uninformed, or untrained in those specific fields, not uneducated and certainly not stupid. Therefore, you may be educated in various other fields, just not in the field of cyber crimes like fraud and scams. Yes, you heard that right. Fraud and scams are cyber crimes. So people who get scammed are not stupid and that myth we must simply dispel. Our guest today is Dr. Jonathan Farley. He graduated cum laude from Harvard University with a second highest grade point average in his graduating class. He obtained his doctorate in mathematics from Oxford University after winning Oxford's highest mathematics awards for graduate students, the Senior Mathematical Prize and Johnson University Prize. He has been a visiting professor of mathematics at Caltech a science fellow at Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation, also a visiting scholar in the Department of Mathematics at Harvard University, and a visiting associate professor of applied mathematics at MIT. Seed Magazine named Dr. Farley one of 15 people who have shaped the global conversation about science in 2005. Dancing with the Stars, Danica McKellar, star of the hit TV show, The Wonder Years, and a judge for the 2016 Miss America Beauty Pageant, called Dr. Farley the incomparable, brilliant Jonathan Farley in a New York Times bestselling book, Hot X Algebra Exposed. So let us invite Dr. Farley for this conversation. Jonathan, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. But if I can make one correction, I graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. Thank you for that correction. I am eternally grateful that you agreed to this interview. 
um, with us today because there, you know, there's a huge myth out there. You may have heard me in the introduction. Um, it's an absolute myth that only stupid people get scammed. And um, it is something that we really need to change because the, the problem with that is that it becomes an underreported crime. People, uh, because, because of the myth, people want to hide in shame. They don't want to talk. Um, and something that's very, very heartbreaking for me is that many of the people who have, and I want to not call them victims, I want to call them survivors. Survivors of scam um, often find themselves destitute. Um, they get disowned from by their families. Um, they lose their jobs. And all of this is because of that one little myth um, that it happens to stupid people. And the other thing that people often think is it cannot happen to me. It won't happen to me. You know, I'm smarter than you. Um, but it's not about that, as I said in the introduction. Um, you know, doctors, lawyers, just about psychologists. I've had a psychologist on the show who got scammed. So anybody out there, if you think that it cannot happen to you, you are dead wrong. The truth of the matter is that by virtue of the fact that you have an online presence makes you a target. And the other thing I want to talk about um, is that we have this image that it's somebody in a dingy location that's scamming, but it's really a organization, a worldwide organization that works with military precision and they are experts in mind manipulation. So those are the kind of things that I really would like for us to talk about. Um, so for those of the, you who, for the audience who doesn't know about your experience, could you tell us what happened to you? Uh, yes. So I uh, wanted to get married and I, rather than play the sorts of games one has to play in the United States where I am, I decided to focus on women who were upfront about wanting to get married. So I uh, signed up for a particular site called elenasmodels.com uh, and I uh, wrote several women who were in a particular city where I was at the time in Russia, Amsk in Siberia. And uh, one replied. <laughs> uh, and so I went to meet her in a cafe in Amsk. So even though we, we met via a website, we met in person within a day of my contacting her. And I thought the conversation was not so very interesting, but uh, we stayed uh, in email contact. And a few months, a few months later, she actually wanted me to meet her parents, she said. So I uh, happened to be in Europe at the time. And so I uh, actually had been invited to speak at a Czech university and they covered my international travel. But when I was there, I decided to also fly uh, to visit her again. This time she was in Turkey in a city called Alanya. And so she you actually, sorry, Jonathan. So you actually met her in person. This wasn't a purely online relationship. Correct. So the typical scam story for romance scams is that it's some bearded guy uh, in, in his basement, maybe in his house, who's typing and, and catfishing you, pretending to be a beautiful Russian woman. But no, I met a beautiful woman. She had a Russian accent. I assume she was Russian. Uh, and uh, then I met the people she said were her parents. And very funny things happened early on. For example, the day I was supposed to meet the parents, suddenly they were in Alanya, Turkey, and no longer in Amsk, Russia. Uh, we were supposed to meet at a landmark in Alanya called the Red Castle, I believe, and, and we didn't meet for some reason. She kept saying, where are you, where are you, for about two hours, and then I met the alleged parents later. And I thought this was funny, and several years later, I, I added up all of the small, funny things that happened that made my uh, spidey sense go off, as it were, if you know comics. Uh, and uh, I realized later that they actually probably were warnings that something strange was happening. I don't have any proof, but in this case, maybe they wanted to just make sure they knew where I was while they were checking out my hotel room. I, I don't know. But I did meet the alleged parents. And uh, another strange thing, to my surprise, they were actually very happy to meet me. They're very pleasant, um, which you normally wouldn't think because I'm there meeting a 20-year-old girl at the time I was 42, 43, 
And uh, most parents you think wouldn't be perhaps elated to have their daughter marry someone more than twice her age, but uh, these parents were. Their personality is rather different from that of the daughter, which was another sign I realized that maybe they weren't who they said they were. But uh, I met them and they had a very posh apartment right by the water, right, right on the Mediterranean. And so I thought, if anything, they are richer than I am. So they couldn't possibly want any of my money. She couldn't possibly be wanting my money because she's wealthy. Um, but I now realize in retrospect that this was probably part of the elaborate scam, that the people I met were probably not her parents. They were probably hired or part of the criminal organization in order to make it seem as if they were her parents and hence I would be disarmed. And they probably just rented that expensive flat precisely to make me think that they couldn't possibly be interested in my money. Uh, so why do I think that? It's because since ultimately I realized that the whole point of the long-term plan, and it took three years, was to get permanent residency in the United States, what we call the green card, and of course to take as much of my money as she could or as they could, I realized that no girl is gonna introduce me to her parents who's gonna do that, even prostitutes don't introduce you to their parents. Uh, and that is essentially what she would have been engaged in uh, to get my money just for the green card. Also, it's important to note that this was a three-year plan. So normally you would think someone who wants to scam you to take your money will want to do it quickly. And indeed, she did suggest very early on that I bring her to the United States under a fiancé visa, but you can call me arrogant uh, I just thought that she was so enamored of me or impressed by me that she wanted to move things along quickly. Uh, as it happens, uh, she said that she tried to get a visitor's visa and was denied. And she called me up saying that she was crying. I now don't know if any of that was true, but it wasn't for another three years that I brought her over to the United States. It wasn't for three years. Uh, it wasn't until um, three years later that she even asked me for any money. So it was a very long-term scam, and uh, I was left thinking, who does this? You know, just for, <laughs> I, I, I'm not actually wealthy. I, I'm, I will be someday, but I'm not right now. I'm just an ordinary university professor. Uh, I make enough money for myself, but you wouldn't think that it would be worth spending three years with a group of people. And there was a group of people, and that's what I realized uh, uh, at the end. Um, actually, about nine days before I saw her for the last time, I didn't actually think that uh, we were gonna be getting uh, separated legally the next week. But um, I moved out because her behavior had become, um, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I'd moved out of the apartment that I rented. Uh, but when I, uh, a year later, when I looked at surveillance video footage, because she uh, stole all the almost all the furniture. Uh, I saw about a day before I saw her for the last time, uh, she was coming up the stairs in the, uh, the basement part of our 25 or 30 story apartment complex with some man. Now you might think she was having an affair. Uh, now from the body language, it didn't seem to me as if they were having an affair. But my question that I have to this day and probably will have for the rest of my life is, who was this person? What was he there? This was taken at about 4.19 a.m. the, the day before the, I, the last time I saw her. Uh, I think that that man may have been there to kill me. And that's not hyperbole. Uh, here's why. The day before I saw her for the last time, we had arranged for me to take her to the airport so that she could fly away forever. Uh, and uh, the day she was going to fly away was the day we were going to go to the lawyer's office and sign the legal separation papers. But this was the day before. And uh, it's possible that if your marriage is collapsing, you might want to see your wife right, and try to repair things. And I, I didn't but it's perfectly conceivable that I might have gone to my apartment, uh, even though I moved out of it, uh, at whatever time, 
uh, if I only have one day left because I've bought the plane tickets for her to try to say, let's reconcile. Now, if I had gone to my apartment, then this mystery man would have been there. And uh, what do you think would have happened? I'm sure the mystery man, who knows what he'd been told, uh, the mystery man probably would have tried to force me out of my apartment. This is all hypothetical now. And uh, and an in, in ensuing conflict, because I, I wouldn't leave my own apartment because some stranger tells me to leave my apartment. Um, probably my wife could have taken a kitchen knife and stabbed me in the back. And with the laws that we have in America today, that would have been ruled self-defense. So I, uh, even though I myself don't like to say I am a survivor, uh, I actually um, think that that was a possibility, that my wife could in fact have intended to murder me. That is a perfectly plausible, plausible scenario. Uh, she did say the week before that she was connected to the Russian mafia and that if I, uh, uh, something about how I might wind, if something happened to her, she said, I might wind up in the news meaning I might wind up in the newspapers, you know, article about me saying that I've been killed. And at the time I thought she was simply mad because she said this the day I moved out of the apartment. But in retrospect, once she stole all, almost all of the furniture, I realized, oh, wait a minute. Uh, she couldn't have done that by herself. She'd been in the United States less than four months. She didn't have a car. Um, she knew English, admittedly, but she'd never been to this city in particular before. She didn't know this city. I didn't know the city and I'd lived there for three years. Uh, and I, myself, as an American, knowing English and having lived in the city, couldn't have emptied my apartment in the two-day period that she had to do it. Uh, that required organization, ergo organized crime, ergo the mafia, Russian or otherwise. So I realized after she left, after I discovered the theft about two days later, that she had been serious when she said she was connected to the Russian mafia uh, and that uh, she was part of it and that it was part of a network. And so I looked back at all of the strange incidents, all of the weird things that had happened, all the things that she had said that made me think that doesn't sound right or that seems weird. Uh, and I realized, oh yes, um, this was a plan from the very beginning, from the moment I emailed her on that website, elenasmodels.com, this had been the plan. So you might think it couldn't be a scam because I approached her. <laughs> no, she was like a spider and I walked into the web. That is, <clears throat> that is basically what happens in these scams and, and it's something that people need to realize. I cannot emphasize it enough that, you know, as you said, you know, you walked into the spider's web and that is exactly how it happens for everybody else out there because they fall hook, line and sinker for the picture of an attractive man or an attractive woman um, and that's simply the bait. And and what people don't understand, it, it was not the exact same case in, in, in your instance, but what people don't understand is that that's the bait used to hook people and um, and they are literally manipulated over a long period of time. It's not a it's not something that happens in a day or two days or three days. As you said, in your case, it was three years, um, and that is a is a typical thing of, you know that that happens to most people. And in that period of time, um, you are manipulated without you even realizing that you're being manipulated by not just one person but by a group of people yes. um, and I cannot emphasize that enough it's not just one person it's a large network of people that are interconnected um, and 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 one of the ways that they gain access to people or access to their to their victims or potential victims is the fact that there's so much anonymity allowed on social media networks. Anyone can go and create a fake profile. It, it's quick and it's easy to do it and you can hide behind a fake profile and the social networks are not taking responsibilities. They're hiding behind a law that was um, in effect, I think 22 years ago in the United States. Well, um, and they use that as an excuse not to verify users. 
or authenticate them. Well, even the legal system, I uh, now have gotten a divorce, but it took me three years because my uh, wife left the country uh, and I haven't heard from her since then. But uh, I, I, the only thing I can say with her, about her with certainty <laughs> is that she was my wife because I don't know what her real name was. Everything she told me could have been a lie. Uh, I said that she was 20 when I met her. All I mean to say is she said she was 20. I saw what looked like legal documents, like something that looked like a passport, and that would indicate that she was 20 when I met her, but I have no idea how easy those things are to forge in Russia if you've got money behind you. I have no idea. Um, now, uh, I did do some searching. I, I haven't looked at her Facebook page in uh, over two years. Uh, her name is Alona Dauksha, but I, uh, you know, I, I would assume that, I, I, I think she may have in fact gone to university in the city of Omsk, um, uh, but whether those people were her parents or not, I have no clue. Um, and so what was annoying was that in the legal process of getting a divorce, besides the fact that they didn't let me get a divorce for three years, even though she had left the country and I, didn't, I haven't heard from her, hadn't heard from her for years, uh, you know, they asked me to, to swear to certain things and eventually my lawyer told me, you just say what, you know, to the best of your knowledge. But, uh, you know, they wanted to know, was she in the military, all this stuff. Now I'm pretty sure she wasn't. But it was, um, it, it's annoying that it had to fall to me to swear about information concerning her when she was a criminal. I mean, uh, she wasn't actually convicted of theft because, uh, again, a problem with the law. Uh, a wife can legally take everything that a husband has, everything without his knowledge or permission, and it's not considered theft. Uh, but, and she probably knew that, uh, but there was a police report. I filed it the same night that I discovered the theft, about two hours after uh, her plane took off, whether she got on the plane or not, I, again, I don't know. <laughs> I saw her enter the security area, but for all I know, she doubled back. Um, so this is a problem with the, the legal system as well. And also there's a problem with how people perceive uh, the, the victims. It was an elaborate scam. I had read many books about scams, especially with uh, mail order brides. And so I thought that I was prepared and I had never seen anything in any of the books that I read uh, mentioning a scam like this, that the person might be working with others. Because I knew that what she accomplished, she couldn't have done on her own. For example, removing almost all the furniture. One person can't do that. But a moving company, any reputable moving company would not just come to an apartment in a posh apartment building with expensive furniture, see a, at this time she was supposedly a 23 year old woman, see a 23 year old girl and then say, we're just gonna take all this stuff out for you. I don't think any reputable, including not just the furniture, but things like vacuum cleaners and stuff like that. I don't think and any- And it's such a quick, and it's such a quick space of time. Yes. Because, you know, there wasn't enough time to to plan all this. It just yes. simply wasn't in that time frame. Yes, someone planned it for her, or, there, or this was the plan from the very beginning, uh, in two days, because that was the space of time from when she said, she wanted the plane ticket to leave and just wanted a divorce to the time of the, the plane that she said she wanted to be on um, uh, to two and a half days or two days from the time I told her, yes, I'll buy the ticket. Um, Americans couldn't have done that. Americans could barely have, have done that. I couldn't have done that. It would have taken me two weeks minimum to plan to empty my apartment. Uh, and then of course, Assuming she did get on the plane to leave, obviously the the, the uh, furniture was taken somewhere else, probably sold. No reputable person would just say, oh, you're going to sell all this expensive new stuff for probably pennies on the dollar uh, or maybe not. But um, no, no one is no one would think that this was all above board. Only another criminal organization would have um, accepted this. And so. I believe her when she told me she was connected to the Russian mafia. That's probably the, one of the few things I do believe about her. Right. Jonathan, I'd like to talk a little bit about 
um, how you have been treated and how people who became victims of of scams um, are treated because you know I've I've interviewed a number of people and victims of scam are treated dreadfully they get disowned by their families um, here in South Africa certainly I am aware of a number of women who um, have had to resort to living in shelters where the conditions are horrendous. It is so bad that I would say the conditions are actually inhumane and that the government really needs to step in and investigate these shelters for the inhumane manner in which they treat the people that live there. You know, for example, they take their um, their cards that they get from the government to um, to get an amount of money for the month to to sustain themselves. Those cards are taken from them and and held. So they basically are held hostage. They don't wow. get medical treatment when they need medical treatment. Um, they get fed food you wouldn't feed your dog. That wow. is how bad the conditions are. So I want to know from you what would you want to say to people who treat victims of scams this badly? Uh, well, to, uh, to quote Greta Thunberg, how dare you? <laughs> I, I think that it is um, disgusting. Uh, a couple, since my story has been put on uh, you know, YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and t local television where I am now, uh, I've gotten very few supportive messages um, I even had one person email me angrily from London. <laughs> he was angry with me. I was the the crime victim. And you, the and you, the victim. Yes, he was angry with me because uh, he thought that it was embarrassing uh, to all black people that I was fooled by this girl. He said, and I told him, well, she wasn't a girl. It was a twenty year old woman, twenty three year old woman, maybe even older. That was just what she. That was just the age she told me. Uh, uh, I think older because the plot was so elaborate. I don't think I'd like to believe that a twenty-year-old couldn't have done it before because there wouldn't be enough but it's, time. But it's not just her. That was the yes, point. Yes, it wasn't just it's, her. It's not just her. She was yes. part of a. She was be. She was a a a, a pawn. Yes. In an in a network, a worldwide network, a web that you yes. got caught into. So it's not just that you got scammed by a girl or yes, a person. True. true, but she was an adult woman. And also the um, uh, this man was angry with, with me and he failed to recognize just what you said, that it was really a network of people who were operating against me. And then also uh, there was a, uh, a YouTube channel, which you looked at. I myself didn't have the stomach for it, uh, which spent, I think, 20 minutes attacking me. Um, and uh, be in this case, it was because my wife was Russian and not, say, of African descent or, of, of, you know, black. But it was um, uh, brutal. And, uh, you know, again, I'm the victim. I just wanted to get married to uh, someone who was nice. And um, the uh, response is... I deserve what I got. Um, they wouldn't say this to anyone else. So on a few occasions when I do reply to people online, I will say things like, uh, do you go to the nearest hospital's burn unit and make fun of the burn victims? Because that's the kind of person you are because uh, you're looking at me and, and uh, attacking me, insulting me, mocking me and saying, I deserved what I got. Many male victims of romance scams actually get the same treatment um, because there's this idea, uh, you know, women can shoot for the stars when they're looking for a spouse. They can aim to marry a guy who's gonna be president and that's great. Um, but when a man wants what he wants, and yes, it's true, typically men want women who are attractive, um, who are young, um, but in my case, it was actually a little bit more than that. My wife was those things, but uh, I also wanted someone who was nice. Uh, I had been with other girls who argued all the time, and this girl didn't. 
Um, I, as I said, I didn't think she was after my money because she gave the appearance of being wealthier than I was, as if she would be taking a step down to marry me. She didn't seem, she never asked me what my salary was. Um, she sometimes said, how's your job? But that was the extent of it. At one stage, I even told her that I, I was gonna take a job in China. I wound up not taking that job, but I told her this and that didn't phase her at all. So you would think that someone who just wanted me for my money would go, oh wait, uh, he's gonna take a job in China and I want a green card to the United States. Okay, I'm gonna end this. No, she never, it didn't phase her at all when I said, I'm going to take a job in China. So she gave the appearance of actually caring, um, or at least she didn't give the appearance of not caring um, about me. She seemed to care about, um, she, she, she seemed not to be interested just in the green card to the United States and just in uh, taking my money. So uh, to me, those are valuable things that we never had an argument until uh, she came to the United States, uh, except for one occasion. Uh, and this occasion I could justify because we were in Italy and her she got new shoes and her feet were bleeding from the new shoes. And so she was a little cross and I could, um, and, and then she seemed sorry for it. Uh, so I could tolerate that, and that was one occasion. Otherwise, everything between us was smooth until she came to the United States three years later, and then her behavior um, totally changed about two or three days after she came. So that was the surprise, and that could happen to anybody. There are people who have been married for 20 years, and then they get a divorce. No one says, oh, the man was stupid because he married a woman who then wound up divorcing him and taking everything. Um, and uh, so this is the uh, what is slightly annoying to me that especially when it's a male victim of romance scams, the public almost seems united in the idea that there's something wrong with a man and the man deserved it. Um, again, I'm a little self-conscious, but in my defense, there are many other reasons also for not marrying someone my own age because someone my own age is for biological reasons isn't going to be able to have kids. And um, uh, so this is, and, and or if I marry someone even 15 years younger than I am, she'll wanna have kids immediately. And I may not want to have kids immediately. So there are many reasons that should satisfy people who don't like the idea of just marrying some, some you know, a pretty picture. But I wanna emphasize that it wasn't just a pretty picture. Jonathan, that is, you know, I really hope that many people will 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 watch this interview and feel that they've learned something from it because I have really spoken to so many people who even after they've realized that they were scammed and when you realize you've been scammed it's it's a huge thing it's it's mess it's a massive shock to your system um to the point where many victims have committed suicide, they retreat uh, inwardly. Um, it's a, it's a highly underreported crime. It's a, I want to emphasize it's a crime. It's criminal yes. to do yeah. what they do um, to people. It's underreported because the perception out there is that it's a shameful thing. Um, the other problem that I also find with reporting is that very often the police are less than sympathetic. Yes, in my case, um, I, I don't uh, want to bash the policeman who came. I did call the police um, immediately after I discovered the theft, well, maybe within 20 minutes after I discovered my wife had stolen almost everything. And the police did come uh, and I made a report, but as soon as they found out that the criminal was my wife, they had to change the designation of the crime um, and they called it a dispute in the police report, but it wasn't a dispute because I took it to the airport, everything was cordial, <laughs> and I came back to the apartment that she had vacated. It was still my apartment. I had simply moved out to another apartment, uh, and I came back to the apartment she had vacated, discovered that almost everything had been uh, stolen, and uh, then called the police. Um, but the, uh, so I won't say that the policeman may was unsympathetic, he may have had rules to follow, but the rules should change. It should not be considered legal for a wife to just take everything 
without the husband's knowledge or permission. And I'm pretty sure that if I had done something similar to my wife, it would not have been treated that way, regardless of what the law says. So this is the whole problem. Also, why did I move out? I, uh, I actually had been reading a web page called A Voice for Men. It's a whole site, actually. But they talked about what happens in cases of uh, marriages that fall apart, how the wife will lie sometimes. And so my wife was behaving in ways like what I had read in these articles. And so that was what made me decide to move out because I wanted to move on, not just so she could stop hurling abuse at me, which is what she was doing, insults uh, constantly. I wanted to make it so that she couldn't even lie about anything. Um, as it turns out, when I met with uh, lawyers working for the state's attorney uh, in order to file charges against my wife, the lawyer working for the state's attorney actually laughed. She literally laughed at me. And uh, she was saying that um, because I had left the apartment, my wife could do whatever she wanted with it. So apparently that's the legal position that uh, if you leave the apartment to protect yourself, then your wife can do whatever she wants with anything in the apartment. So uh, my message <laughs> to men now, this is a slightly different topic, is don't get married <laughs> unless you have very solid protections. And even then, prenuptial agreements get thrown out the window. And again, your wife could say whatever she wants um, and police might do something to you. So that didn't happen to me, but it was because I was warned by this website, A Voice for Men, that I left. And maybe that's when my wife realized, okay, I can't get him now. Uh, so I'll just leave because within nine days, she was, she had left the country. At least that was the last time I saw her and she was supposed to have left the country. So this is, um, uh, uh, yeah, so that was uh, one point that I want to make. And then in terms of the, um, how it hits you, once I realized that the whole thing had been a scam from the very beginning, I was floored. Right, so I, I was locked in by contract to pay for the new apartment, <laughs> and it was a posh apartment. And I told you I have a modest income, um, so I was paying for two apartments because I couldn't get out of the leases for either one of them, and I had to pay for two apartments for a whole year without being able to use one of them because there was nothing in it to use. Um, and uh, then every time I went to that apartment to uh, just take a look at it, make sure that there wasn't running water or something like that. Um, I was floored for the weekend. You know, so I'd go once a month to pay the check and just inspect the apartment to make sure that it, uh, nothing bad was happening to it. And then I would be done for the, for the weekend. And it took me about a year. Until, uh, for a whole year, I would wake up angry every day that, that someone, Alona Dauksha, could have done this uh, to me and the other people who were involved. Um, it took about a year and I wish I could tell your audience that you do recover, but it's been three years. And while I don't wake up angry every, every day, I, I haven't for probably two years. I, um, uh, I, I haven't recovered. Um, and, that's, uh, that's another aspect of, hmm. uh, becoming a victim of a scam is the psychological, effects you know what it does what it does to you people have no idea how that affects you and because it's i feel it's a misunderstood you know it's because it's such an underreported crime it's a misunderstood crime and therefore we don't even have the correct treatment psychological treatment available to victims of scam because this is something that still needs to be investigated and documented um and then you, they need to work out what the correct protocols would be for treating someone who became a victim of cyber crime um i really feel this is something that um that needs to be looked at because it's it's there, there just isn't a diagnosis yet for what happens to a a victim of this kind of crime yeah, so uh, I, and how to treat them it doesn't exist yeah. Yeah. So economically, I survived it. Um, I estimate roughly that I, I lost probably 50,000 US dollars and a, a typical salary is about <laughs> family income is about that. Um, but uh, over the course of the, 
the three year period because I regard everything she did as fraudulent. It was fraudulent. Um, and so all that money, I, I'm not saying that she stole the $50,000, but that was the amount of money that I spent. She stole a lot, but that was the amount of money that I spent um, and it was all fraudulent. But the, uh, you know, on, on her part and the part of whoever she was working with. Uh, but I was thinking of the Auden poem before we came on, which has a line like, uh, the stars are not wanted now, put out every one, pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. And uh, that's how I, uh, I wade through life now. You know, I, 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 I do, I'm a mathematician, I do math, that makes me uh, somewhat happy, but otherwise I don't really, care. Uh, the usual things about volunteering, helping other people, I, I've done some of that, but it doesn't make up for, um, for it. And the fact that it could have been worse, I actually think I could have been murdered, and maybe I still can be murdered. Um, the, uh, the fact that I, um, it could have been worse doesn't make me feel any better. Um, I, I, it's supposed to. That's the one uh, solution that people come up with. Just imagine think of all the good things that are happening, um, but it doesn't help me. Um, so I'm just going through the motions with life. It, it, there's nothing and, you pleasing, know, in, really. In, and in your case, um, you know, you have been able to economically move forward, but there are many people um, who simply didn't have the tool set or the skills um, to move forward from there and they commit suicide. That's how, um, how, how much being scammed can affect you psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that unfortunately, because of the misconception of what happens in a scam, people get disowned by their very own families. And that is very, very heartbreaking. So in my case, it actually brought um, my family together, but um, there, I remember having an unfortunate argument with my mother because I had taken my wife to my parents' house. My father passed away many years before this, but the, uh, I'd taken my, my wife to my mother's house and uh, the neighbors had a party for us. And then at some point my wife disappeared and after an hour, I was wondering, where is my wife? <laughs> this whole party is for her. Where is she? And so she had gone back to the house. And so now I don't know what she had yeah. done. Was she rifling through the drawers? Was she taking jewelry? Who knows? But um, my wife, uh, my mother talked to my wife and then came to me and said, you know, is, does she tell the truth? Because my wife had was pretending that she had gotten sick. And my mother didn't believe that. And I argued with my wife because I, I, I was angry that my mother could think that my wife was anything but honest. <laughs> and I now realize, of course, my mother saw through my wife. I did not. And so I obviously I apologized to my mother months later when I discovered the truth. Uh, one of my brothers is a lawyer and uh, he thought that I shouldn't bother pursuing anything because no one cares about a 40 something man who married a 20 something woman. And that actually might be true, but if it's true, that is just prejudice against 40 something men. I don't lose my rights because I'm a 40 something man who married a 20 something woman. Um, uh, just, uh, 20 something women don't gain, uh, don't have carte blanche to rob anyone, to lie in, about anyone, or who knows what she was doing with my credit cards. You know, she knows my social security number. Um, they don't have carte blanche to do all of that just because they're young and I am middle-aged. Um, and also, I don't want to say that uh, the people who commit suicide are doing what's wrong. If, if I am found dead of, committed of, of suicide, uh, I want police to investigate it. <laughs> it could be the Russian mafia, but um, uh, trying to get revenge for exposing them. But, uh, I, you know, Look at my life. I would like to think I can recover, but in fact, I was the one who had years stolen from my life. I could have taken, uh, so you showed a photograph, I think, of my wife and me maybe in 
Amsterdam yeah. or something like that. And uh, I could have taken uh, someone else to those places, to Italy, to uh, to France, someone who would have appreciated it. And now, at the age I am now, it would be pretty weird for me to marry someone who is, or, or to even date someone who is that age. Uh, someone who is that age would clearly either, either have some issue, some mental problem, or want to uh, just be with someone who's gonna pay for stuff, which obviously no one wants. Uh, so, um, whereas when I was in my early 40s, it was a different story. I was right on the cusp where it would have been, it could have been acceptable. There are marriages where the gap is 20 years and there've been successful marriages and the state, they stayed married for decades. Uh, I know several people like that. Um, but when it gets up to 25, <laughs> 30, then it becomes weird. And um, this is important because as I said, there are objective reasons for wanting to, to date someone who's that age because they can have kids without any complications. You don't have to spend $100,000 on fertility treatments. So um, I was robbed of that as well. And going forward, since time only goes in one direction, I, I can't get that back. Now I know in America, your audience is worldwide, but in America, they hate people who whine. So I don't wanna give that appearance. I'm just stating a reality. And the people who have the solution to those who are sad say, uh, oh, just uh, you know, turn that frown upside down or these trite uh, solutions. They don't work because the objective conditions have not changed. Objectively, what makes the person upset has not changed. Right. You know, what would perhaps help me is if my wife and the people connected with her were arrested. Um, if I could find out who this mystery man was in the surveillance video footage, but I'm never going to find out who that was. And uh, no one in Russia is going to pursue my wife criminally. In America, as I said, it's not even regarded as a crime. But it's quite interesting because there are other crimes that take place between married couples that are regarded as crimes by the law. But this one, a, a wife can do whatever she wants. And presumably, as I said, my wife could even perhaps have murdered me and gotten away with it. Yes, unfortunately, when it comes to cybercrime, a lot of work needs still needs to be done. And, um, you know, hopefully by having conversation, candid conversations like these, we move in the right direction towards getting um, scams recognized as a cyber crime and um, getting getting the right treatment for victims, um, having these processed properly, getting the psychological help um, for victims. So we, we hope that this conversation has helped many out there watching this. And my hope is also that families of victims who are watching this would reach out to them um, and help them instead of disowning them because then the abuse literally, you know, they've been in that abusive um, situation with not just one person, but a group of people. Um, but that abuse effectively continues when they are um, disowned by their families, friends, co-workers, colleagues. Yes, it's rubbing salt in the wound. Correct. Jonathan, we're out of time. Is there anything that you would like to say in closing? Uh, yeah, just continue the great work that you're doing. Uh, you don't have to be stupid to be a victim of, of cybercrime or romance scams, but make sure that, uh, you know, if you have these little feelings about something that seems odd, trust them. That's a great note to end on. Thank you for being a guest today, um, and thank you for the candid conversation. You're welcome.